warm welcome to today's Southport Methodist Circuit Service here on the 4th of July 2021, which is the National Thank You Day. During the pandemic, it has been very challenging. There's been incredibly difficult circumstances and quite a lot of heartbreak. Yet there have been things to be thankful for. Our NHS, care workers, pharmacists, food, heating providers, communications, etc. There was even a post on the internet called Not Everything is Cancelled, which reads, Sunshine is not cancelled. Spring is not cancelled. Love is not cancelled. Relationships are not cancelled. Reading is not cancelled. Naps are not cancelled. Devotion is not cancelled. Music is not cancelled. Dancing is not cancelled. Imagination is not cancelled. Kindness is not cancelled. Conversations are not cancelled. And hope is not cancelled. What are you thankful for? Here is what some of you have said. Thank you, God, for getting me through the COVID period safely and for the support of friends. I thank you, Lord, for Q Woods. Walking the dogs here has been my refuge and my sanctuary during lockdown. Thank you. I thank God for Lola. She's been my constant companion during COVID and we've been out on long walks together. So I'm great, very grateful for her company. I thank God for his patience and his unfailing love towards me every day because I mess up frequently and he never gives up on me. I thank God for the gift of music, which relaxes me both mentally and spiritually. What a stress buster. Rock and roll. I can lie down, go up 
to sleep, knowing you're watching over me. Oh, wonderful Lord, oh, wonderful God, help me to trust you forever. I need not fear, cause you are near, I can lie down and sleep in peace. God says to give thanks in everything. That doesn't mean you need to give thanks for everything. You don't need to give thanks for that bad day, or for that bad relationship, or being passed over at work, financial hardship. Whatever it is, you are not to give thanks for the difficulties, but rather in the difficulties. That is a very important distinction, and one I think we often miss. Giving thanks in everything shows a heart of faith that God is bigger than the difficulties and that he can use them. If you approach him with the right heart and spirit for your good and his glory. Tony Evans In happy moments, Praise God. In difficult moments, seek God. In quiet moments, worship God. In painful moments, trust God. Every moment, thank God. By Rick Warren. Other religions have sages and prophets which show us how to reach God. But Christianity is different. It has a God that came to earth to reach us. Christianity shows God reaching out to us and taking part in our suffering. So with that in mind, let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you know us, you know us completely, and you understand us. Thank you for your strength and support during difficult times, for walking with us, for taking our pain and disappointments. And thank you for the joy of your creation and its beauty. Thank you for the joy of friendships and relationships. And thank you for life eternal with you. Amen. So let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Shirley Potts will now sing El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty, giving him the focus that he deserves. And then John Durkin will read today's Bible passage to us. Should I? 
of our God is holy mountain. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Like the utmost heights of Zaphon is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. When the king joined forces, when they advanced together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. I remember seized them there, pain like that of a woman in labour. You destroyed them like ships of Tarshish, shattered by an east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, Count her towers, consider well her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell to them of the next generation. For this is God, is our God, for ever and ever. He will be our guide, even to the end. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The city of our God, the holy place, the joy of the whole earth. Great is the Lord in whom we had the victory. He aids us against the enemy. We bow down all Lord, we want to thank you for the world 
Just for a bit of fun, I've got some pictures to show you. And I'd like you to see if you can guess what they are. This is the first one. Can you guess what it is? It is the top of a ballpoint pen. There you go. How about the second one? Can you guess what that is? Does it look familiar? It is the bottom of a sanitizing bottle jar. And the last one. Hope you're enjoying this. Can you guess what this one is? Hmm? It is the end of a gas lighter. Sometimes it can be very difficult to see the big picture because we only have so much information and we just don't understand the whole thing. We don't understand everybody's view. We don't understand everybody's feelings. We don't understand what God is doing it even. We've got lots of questions because we can see such a small part of a picture but think we've got it all. And the Bible backs that up in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9, it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, I was brought up in a, an atheist family who I love dearly. And at the age of 13, after attending Tick Hill Methodist Church in South Yorkshire, I made a decision to explore Christianity and find out more about Christ. I then went on to do a theology degree at Hull University and then did more theology when I trained to be a minister. I taught religious education for 15 years at the local high school, and I've been involved in church all of my adult life. Now, when I was in my 20s, I knew it all. I knew all the answers to all the questions, and I was incredibly black and white, because I didn't have a great experience of life. I didn't have a great, such a great experience of God at that point. But now I'm nearing my 60s and I'm in late 50s, I realize how little I actually know. How little I understand the big picture. For something I am assured of, which I know, is that God loves me. That he's been a support and strength for me through my life. And I feel a calling on my life to show his love to others and to share that assurance that I feel. But with the rest, there's still many questions on this big picture. And what we need to ask ourselves is what is really important? What is the foundation of our faith? And Corinthians actually says it is love. Faith, hope and love. 
and the greatest of these is love. So whatever's going on in our lives at the moment, make sure we balance it by having love as the foundation in all that we do. Now, the passage today is Psalm 48. And why have I told you all that before? It's because I want us to see the big picture, even of this psalm. Psalm 48, St. Jerome says regarding the Old Testament, it's pregnant with Christ. St. Jerome, it's pregnant with Christ. And the Old Testament is pregnant with Christ, and this passage is no different. But on the surface, in the historical context, we, we can tell by the mentioning of the ships of Tarshish that this psalm takes place in Jehoshaphat's reign, which was 873 to 849 BC. During his reign, he overthrew the kings Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Hence the section in the psalm, when the men came to attack Jerusalem, they came, they saw, they ran away. Not like with Caesar, they came, they saw, they conquered. But it actually says they came, they saw, and they took flight. And that is, has its own historical context, context within that moment. But Jerusalem is praised greatly in this passage. But if you look at Jerusalem's timeline, it's been destroyed twice, it's been besieged 23 times, it's been attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. And let's be honest, it isn't that peaceful there even today. So this glorious praise of Jerusalem, the city of God, what is it about? And that's where the big picture comes in. You've seen the historical context. You've seen the timeline. But the big picture is the element of being pregnant with Christ. Because you've got another holy mountain in the Old Testament, and that's Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was a scary place. They put a fence around it to stop the people getting to God in case they died. If an animal went near to the fence, they were stoned to death. And Moses was in fear. And we can see this in Hebrews and also see the contrast to the mountain of Zion. Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 24 says, this is in hindsight, don't forget. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was being commanded. And in fact, even an animal who touches a mountain must be stoned. The sight was to so terrible that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So what we see in this psalm is a contrast from Mount Sinai, which was the old covenant of the Ten Commandments, which was scary because we can't keep rules and we all fail and we do things wrong. So that Mount Sinai was not a good place to be in effect. But what we see in this psalm is the Mount of Jerusalem, the joy, the joy of the whole earth. And why is it the joy of the whole earth? That's because of the new covenant. Because God knew that he was going to send Jesus. Jesus came down and the joy is from that forgiveness of sin, from that freedom from the law, and that having a living relationship with God, which is the all-important part of the Christian faith. So Jerusalem is to be praised because God is in Jerusalem 
as in Jesus called himself the temple of Jerusalem, and that his body, the temple, will be pulled down and be rebuilt in three days, which means the resurrection. So you can see the imagery from that psalm going right across into Jesus' life. The psalm also asks us to meditate in verse 9 on God's unfailing love. To meditate on God's unfailing love. Are you aware of God's unfailing love that this psalm talks about? The love that in the future of the psalm comes from Jesus? And do we talk about it? And a lot of the conversations I have are with, oh, this is wrong with the church, and that's wrong with the church, and such a body's done this, and such a body's done that, and, and we don't like the way that that's done. But that isn't talking about the loving nature of God. Maybe we should spend more time talking about him than talking about the negatives. Because we can get so tied up with our health, with our circumstances, with our career, with all different things, and we don't talk about how faithful and loving God is. And that is the bit that gives us the strength to our lives. The passage ends with verse 14. And verse 14 says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. I'll read that again. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. What do you know that lasts forever? I thank God that he lasts forever. When I visit many dying people, it's beautiful to see the peace that can come over them as they prepare to meet with God and the smiles as they sometimes leave and are in that process. But he promises he'll be our guide forever. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I signed up for this Christianity thing thinking it was going to be easy, but it's been far from it. I failed many times made wrong decisions, but God's been with me through it. I've learned from it. And I'm learning about his compassionate nature more and more. And he can be the guide to each of us. So how can we finish? The psalm was written in a time of Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. And you can read about him in 2 Chronicles 20. And these are some of the lessons that he gave. Seek the Lord. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord indeed. They came from every town in Judah to seek him. Do we seek the Lord? Pray to the Lord. If calamity comes upon us, whether plague or famine, we will stand in your presence and we will cry out to you in our distress, says 2 Chronicles 20. Do we do the same? Have we done the same in this pandemic? Look to the Lord. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Again, do we do that? Be courageous in the Lord. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Depend on the strength of the Lord, for the battle is not yours. Worship the Lord. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before their Lord. And that's what we see in Psalm 48. Have faith in the Lord. Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God. And I'll finish with this one, even though there's a lot more. Praise the Lord. Praise him for the splendor of his holiness, saying, give thanks to the Lord. Saying, give thanks to the Lord. On this National Thank You Day, that is my heart's desire, to give thanks to the Lord for the many things he has given me and for the strength he has put upon me. And I pray that you will have your prayers of thankfulness too. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you 
that you are all powerful. You are all knowing. You are all seeing. We thank you that you are at work in our lives, each one of us. And we thank you that you, you lead us if we look to you, that you direct us, that you support us and strengthen us. And Lord, I pray that we might have your insight, that we won't be satisfied with a small bit of the picture that we see, but we'll have your compassionate heart and understanding and think big and think wide, past the traditions of the church, past the indoctrinations on our lives, past our world view, and actually see your love and compassion at work in this world today. And we thank you that we're not alone. Thank you for the fellowship we have with others and mainly the fellowship we have with you. So take our lives afresh. We ask this in your name. Amen. We're now going to end with the hymn, Lord of the Years. Well, thank you for joining us today. I pray that you have a good week. I now say the blessing. The blessing of El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all 
now and always. Amen. Cause you are near, I can lie down and sleep. 